Awo Shalom Rastafari. Once again, this is a, a Shabbat, a Senbet, and a very special and important one, being the fulfillment of the seven um, days, the unleavened bread, the Hag Hamatza, the Kita Injera, and this is the 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 first of what's known as the pilgrim on the Shalosh uh, Regalim, the, the the three pilgrim or the three pilgrimage <clears throat> feast and, and, and festivals, Passover, Fasica, um the unleavened bread and the feast of first fruits. You understand the 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 Bakura, the, the feast of, of first fruits of the first fruits and, and the wave offering. And we was making a, a a commentary on that, first of all, that when we look in the in the vision of Jah, the true vision of Jah, we see that the the third of the 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 holy days or the Shabbats, the particular Shabbats or, or the holy times is it begins with Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which follows, and then the first Sunday. Notice what it says right here. It says in Leviticus 23, chapter 23, verse 9, And Yahweh spake to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. So when we see the children of Israel, here's one important thing we have to understand, who identify ourselves as Ethiopian and Ethiopian Hebrews. And in the calling, the election, as Rastafari, those of us who identify ourselves as Rastafari, amongst the Ethiopian Hebrews, when it says, speak to the children of Israel, refer to Amos 9 and 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O Bane Israel, O children of Israel, the Dekika Israel? And it says, when ye become into the land which I give you. So one thing we have to begin to prepare our hearts and minds is that one of the first things that we have to fulfill when Yahweh fulfills his word and brings us into the land is the feast of first fruits. You know what I'm saying? Which is the feast of first fruits. And it says, and shall reap the harvest thereof. Then ye, saying you all are none to Hulachu, shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh in, 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 in the position, direction of the Tabota Sion or the Ark of the Covenant, which is to say the throne of Jah. You understand? Which is to the throne of Jah. It, it says that. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Shabbat. Now, the morrow or the day after, the tomorrow after the, the Shabbat is what day? It's Sunday. So we now get to understand the, the, the Hebraic link between Ehud, Ehud, we say Ehud the first day, Ethiopically, Ehud, and the Sunday or that first day. So when we look in the New Testament, some say, well, y'all keep the Shabbat. This is the same argument that the, the, the Romanish church or the Roman Catholic church had with the Ethiopians in the, in the 15th and 16th century when they discovered this biblical um, 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 environment. You know, and you have to just read the Roman, the Jesuit um, um, missionaries, their reports, and a lot of it's on the internet, it's online, you know, their commentaries on Ethiopia and their observations, they were writing their reports to the Pope and to the Vatican on what they were seeing and experiencing, and they often note the relation of the Bible and how in all the places that Roman missionaries had gone, including the so-called Holy Land or Northern Palestine, the land of Canaan, the Canaanu, that they had noticed that this place was like this place was like 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 the Bible, the living Bible. Ethiopia was like the living Bible. How the people dress, how their behavior, 
and you know how they the comport the akahe the halaka was was Hebraic and they were heavily Judaic or Hebraic yet messianic or Christian. Now that kind of bothered them because you have to remember that the Romanist church and the Jews and the Khazars, you know, they had their own conflict and controversy with many of the converted and European Jews. You know, so you have to understand these different lines that kind of meet under similar under similar name. But they came into Ethiopia and they noticed that the Ethiopians kept both the seventh day Senbet right, the Sinbet uh, Ayhud or Yehuda, as well, or Kedame, what's known as Kedame, and they also kept um, Ehud, and they would gather on Ehud the first day, much like the King of Kings, who one writer says was covertly Hebrew, that all the officers closed early on Friday. You know, his match often was not seen, no Hosea, uh, you know, no, no, no swine, you know, was in the palace or anything like that, you know, offered as food or what, or whatnot. Um, and how the king of kings own and the, and the royal family and, and, and certain Ethiopians, because just like Israel, not all who say they have Israel are truly Israel. So not all who say they're Ethiopian really Ethiopian. Some people just wandered across the border and ended up there when the map was drawn, you know, they were wandering folks. You understand? While some have laid and built foundations, you understand, ancient and, and, and continued the dynasty, you understand, upon ancient foundation. This is who we speak of when we speak of Kedamawi, Haila, Selassie, our Godfather, Abba Kedus. Kedus, Abba Tachin, in Jesus Christos, Getachin, Sin, in the name of Yeshua HaMoshiach. So, we find Sunday now here for the link with Christ risen. The Moshiach is risen, or the resurrection. This is for us to follow him in the resurrection. Those who would follow Yeshua, the Son of Man, Rastafari, in the resurrection. You understand? The regeneration. We're speaking about this is the time of the regeneration. The regeneration means being born again, basically. You know, regenerous, you know, regenerate, in other words. So we have this particular offering that we cannot truly fulfill because we have not become into the land. When we're speaking about this as, as ethnic Hebrews, as, as the lost sheep, you know, in, in, a, in the land which is not our own, you know, saying the Americas, you know, the Americas and the Caribbean, this land is not our own. You know, one can pretend but, you know, there are signs and, and fulfillment of prophecy that's going to waken many out of that pretend, but it's time to get prepared now you, in your heart and your mind. And so now this now shows us that we have to prepare ourselves when we be coming to the land to fulfill that. So he fulfills his word, you know what I'm saying, and we fulfill our word. That's what a Kal Kidan, that's what a Kal Kidan is all about, I mean, it's a simple, it's a, it's a simple thing, and this is about joy. You know, this is about life and life more abundantly. So, how do people get that that all mixed up out of ignorance? The original, the original chatiyat, the original sin. So, we have right here the feast of uh, first fruits, and this feast is typical of resurrection, the ten sai or ten shai, the first. Of Christos, the first is the Moshiach, is Jesus, is Joshua, and then quote of them that are Christ that belong to Him at His coming. Remember when He says, when He returns, He will have a new name, and we as Rastafari say greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior. This day revealed in the person, the personality of Kedamawi Haile Selassie. The Father and the Son, that duality in Trinity is the Ahadu Amlak or Yahweh Ahad, the Yahweh Ahad. You understand? The, the one, one in the sense of, of unity. You understand? And we're going to deal with the triunity of, of God is throughout the scripture, the real triunity, not the counterfeit, not the fakes. Like when we spell Christ, we're talking about the real Christ, not the counterfeit, so the fakes. You know, but by the real one. So now, so the the the, the feast of 
the first fruits is very, very interesting because that is being fulfilled in the land. Then coming after that is the um, is the Pentecost. You understand know, the fifty days after the resurrection of Christ. Then we have trumpets, which is the prophetic. They say of the future regathering of Beta Israel. So we can study this and apply this. You see, when we when we run the program, once we study the program and we run the program, then we get the results according to the programming. You see what I'm saying? Because the results are built into, you understand, into God's matrix. There's the world within the world. Like it says, we are in the world but not of the world. You understand? But he's our blameless creator because we are born again and we are new creations, you understand, in this old creation that is passing away. You understand? Know this old creation, they're struggling to, you know, stay stay around, but this this old system of things, I mean, just think about all the repeats that are going on. You know what I mean? It's only like they're stuck in a loop when you look at their media and other things, and they are in a loop. So then we get to the Day of Atonement, which, um, and, and tabernacles, you understand? Know and tabernacles. So if you want to look up a little bit more and get a little more verse, with the holy days, you know what I'm saying, and which holy days and, and why, you know, go to our, and our website, there's more information up there, you know what I'm saying, on the holy days, get a Schofield study Bible, download the one, the free copy that we have up there, um, but if you can get a hard copy, it will be well worth um, the money, so check us out at the book site, and th this is a particular one, this is the first Schofield study Bible. A little bit different, they got a new one, New King James, the language in some ways is, is different, and there's some issues with that, but so that we'll be all on the same page as Dek uh, Amezamorit, as disciples, it's best for us to have the same reference materials, you understand, whether in hard copy or digital form. So if there's any questions about that, www.lojsociety.org, you know, as they say, uh, hit us up, uh, you know, with a comment or a critique or something like that, or perhaps some work or fellowship, you understand, or some building or a local branch. Brothers and sisters want to come together and really, you know, build the corporate body of Rastafari. You understand, build the corporate body of Christ and his kingly character. Now, and getting into this particular portion right here, let's go to chapter 9. Let's go to chapter 9, right? Let's go to chapter 9. So this particular Torah portion, and we're still in the book of uh, Vayikra, you understand, Vayikra, um, also known as Orit Ze Lewawiyan, you understand, also known as Orit Ze Lewawiyan, which is the, the, the Torah, the Orit, of the Levites, you understand, of the Levites, the Lewawi, and we explained a little bit on that uh, before. So if one have questions on it, um, we're going to try to find a way where we can, you know, take certain questions, and if we can address them all at one time, we'll try to publish, you know, publish some of the answers on the, on, on the net, you understand, or perhaps in a journal, in a journal form. But what we're really praying for is that, is that just send more co-laborers into this vineyard, you know, ones that would, you know, truly, you know, be discipled and, 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 and understand what's in his words so we can see the big picture, see his vision, you know, and, and, and then work with our respective um, gifts and callings in repentance, because the gifts and the calling of John are without repentance. So ones may be very gifted at certain things, but not having that, um, repentance, the true experience of 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 uh, the kind of as 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 that sacrament, that true experience of Christ in spirit, is really really important according to His Word, because then one's eye is truly open, you know, saying, and they and they recognize the true light of our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMoshiach, to the glory of Kedus Avatach and the King of Kings Kedamawi Haile Selassie. Now. With that being said, this particular Torah portion is known as um, Shemeni. Shemeni, right? And Shemeni 
in the Hebrew, as we already know and should know, is the eighth. It refers to the eighth. Now, Bamarinya, in the Amharic, right, we have, um, was it Simentenya? Is it Simentenya? Best Simentenya Wum. Best Simentenya Wum. And on the eighth day, on the eighth day, so hopefully you've downloaded the, the, um, the uh, Sabbath house readings, the updated one, you know what I'm saying, the updated one, and as we see any corrections or things that need to be updated, we will update and inform you all because we want to understand his way, you know what I'm saying, Yah's way, Jah's way, you understand, and overcome I and I, you know, own ways and things that have gotten, you know, the, have gotten things to the point that they're at now, that we get to recognize that we have to redeem the time because days are evil. You know, we have to prepare our hearts and our minds. So this portion begins in uh, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter, Leviticus chapter 9. Mm-hmm. And it goes to chapter, chapter 11. You understand? Chapter 11. And this portion, it, it, it deals with the consecration of the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, and we can link this with the church in that sense. Remember, the tabernacle, Simentenia, actually refers to um, eight. So let's just read this portion and find out in what way. It says in Leviticus chapter 9, we're at verse 1. This is where it says the priests begin their ministry. So now you can see the link between the disciples after the crucifixion right, um, becoming apostles, you know, going through that, 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 that great experience and even conversion and even strengthening of their faith, you know, saying they, they, they experienced Christ, right? It says, and it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of the Shemagliwoch, of Israel, of Israel. Now, what we're going to learn about in this chapter, if you study the chapter, of course, we're reading about the reading the pattern of Levi. But in order to apply it to the true Melchizedek order of Rastafari, we have to understand what is the pattern, and then the testimony of Christ gives us the upgrade. So we can understand, okay, this is a sacrifice of the animal, but we don't have to sacrifice any animal because Christ has fulfilled that lower type and taken us to a higher, you understand, a higher experience, a higher state of mind, a spiritual state of mind. So we can see these, these earthly signs as symbols, such as leaven. Leaven um, in the Old Testament sense, with the veil still there. You know what I'm saying? In the Old Testament sense, leaven referred to the, the buho, buhe, to the yeast that was put into, like, the bread to make it rise. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament how the woman, upon escaping, you know what I'm saying, the, the children of Israel, the woman didn't have time to fully bake the bread. So this is why they had that unleavened bread. That's what's connected with that in the Old Testament sense. But that's a type we even like to call it mythology, Hebrew mythology. Now, some, some, some have, a, have a strange ignorance that they think is, is, is wisdom. They get upset when you call it mythology. They try to think that mythology is not, it, it doesn't mean, it means something fictional. But that sense of the word is recent as the 1700s. In other words, the true sense of it meant more and tended to the mysteries or the way that ancient man communicated certain principles, a certain testimony, what was important, what, what we can learn from their experience if we approach it in and through Yeshua HaMoshiach, in and through Jesus Christos, in and through his, his wisdom, his faith, his mind, the mind of Christ. Not our own ways of looking at it, but looking at it. But in order to get to that point, one needs to be in the discipline. You understand? The, and that's part of the discipleship. But here... The disciples, as we look at the Old Testament, is the priests begin their ministry. In the New Testament, it's also the disciples now who become commissioned to become Hawariya. 
Haradia apostles. See, that's the next level even for I and I and, and those of the I and them with discipleship. It is, it's, it's going through those basic studies, going through that basic, we'll say three years. In Christ, he ministers for three or so years, and it would take about three cycles of Torah reading, like three or so years of really studying, going over the material to really, I think, if one applies himself, though one year of intensive um, intensive schooling, but not everyone is really up to intensive schooling, perhaps other things they have, other responsibilities, so forth and so on. However, um, in, in, a, in a normal, relaxed, so-called average cycle, it would be about three years, but time we know is not the same as it has been, and that's because of this bridge in conjunction, this crossing over, you know what I'm saying, that humanity is, is going through. So here we have the idea of eighth refers to the eighth day, or Shemeni, Shemeni, Semint, you can see the link between the Ethiopic, the Hebraic, even right there. So now we have three basic um, commentaries or three basic portions to understand in this, in other words, if we were to test ourselves on this, and this is the next aspect that, you know, we are praying to Yahweh to guide I and I as well as other brothers and sisters who, who we seek to fellowship with. Ones may have an idea and, you know, contact I and I with a particular idea, something that perhaps might, might be in the will of Jah that can help to help to promote and put forward his work. And, and, and even if it's something small or something big, you know what I'm saying? Make I and I reason together is, is, is his word. So we have three portions or three, three ideas, tabernacle in this, Nadab and Abihu, Nadav and Avihu, and the dietary laws of Kashrut, of Kashrut. So let's, um, let's go over some of this right here. So we have the RSS. Right, and so we'll call it what number twenty six. I think we already dealt with twenty five. Right, um, we have it. The name is take the Hebrew first, Shemini. Right, Shemini, which basically means the eighth. Now, there's a very interesting idea connected with the eighth because according to our Ethiopian uh, or our Ethiopian. Um, counting or calculation of time since, like, the bridge roughly 2007 or so, we've been in or we're moving into the eighth um, millennia. You understand? There's a, there's a very ancient, and we can call it a Enochian idea, that we're moving into the eighth millennia. So this is also very interesting because there's the whole idea of, of the Sabbath and how does Sunday come into it. Well, Sunday would be that eighth day. You see, Sunday would be that basically eighth day, and we call the eighth day, and from an Ethiopic perspective, not Sunday. We don't even mention the name of the sun in the sense in that it's not a high, not I, but we say Ehud, and Ehud means first in that sense, because when it goes to the seventh, it begins again at that first. But it's key that in, in, in the divine logos or the word, the code, it says eighth, you understand? And that is when the priests also remember in, in connection with the, the, the resurrection, which we touched on in the previous portion, as well as a little bit in this portion, um, the, 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 the way, the first fruits, the first fruits, that one takes place on the morrow after the Sabbath. You understand? And, the, and so the day after the Sabbath is the what? The eighth day. So we see this link once again recurring Christologically. You understand? According to the Christ logos or according to the testimony of the Bible or the Christ word. So that is not just accidental. You understand? That now helps to explain. You understand? And becomes a gateway to, to, to learning more from the word or through the word about this reality that we're experiencing, this life. He came to give us life, and what? Life more abundantly. You understand? Life more abundantly. But we're living in a, 
in, in, in an old programming. You understand? The old man is living in that old program. He must be born again so they can get to the new program, become a new creature or new, a, a new creature in Christ. So you will understand Jesus Christos get touching as our blameless creator, and we are in a world, but it's not the world. You, you see, because there's the world of, of, of Jah, there's the world of God, and it's a real, it's a real world, but these worlds are overlapping because the old world is passing away, and a new world is coming in. You know, and there's a lot of psycho babble about the whole new world order that we, you know, we hope and pray, probably teach a, a lecture on it, um, that ones really not get caught up in that, that programming. Yes, a lot of those things are going on, but what's the solution? What's the salvation? What's the overcoming? Jah, Rastafari is the overcoming, and his way is the overcoming way. Now, this, this portion talks about the tabernacle. So we have the tabernacle and the priest beginning their ministry, right? This portion here. So we're going to go over that for a moment. But the part we want to get to is the strange fire part, right? The strange fire part. Because on the eighth day of the ceremony to ordain the priest and to consecrate the tabernacle, Moses instructed Aaron to assemble calves, rams, goat, lamb, and ox, and a meal offering as sacrifices, which are called the korbanot. The korbanot. Now, I think we have in Ethiopia the korban. The korban are the sacraments. Now, we are told there are um, seven sacraments, right? And here there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, and it, it says six right here. We'll check it out. You know, it appears that there are six korbano in the Old Testament, but now we have also sacraments in 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 the Christina in Christianity or in Christ, right? Um, now here, saying to God was saying today the Lord will appear to you, Leviticus nine one to four. Today, Yahweh or Jah will appear to you. He will reveal himself. He will reveal his, his presence to you. And they brought the Korbano in front of the tent of meeting. And the Israelites, the Beit Israel, they assembled there, Leviticus 9 and 5. Now, Aaron, he offered the Korbano as Moses had commanded in Leviticus chapter 9, verses 8 to 21. Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them in Leviticus 9 and 22. Now, there's some um, hand signs. For example, the priestical hand sign, there's certain hand gestures, just like there's sign language as well. And some speculate that there was a particular um, hand sign of blessing that he blessed the people with. Now Moses and Aaron then went inside the tent of meeting, and, they, and when they came out, they blessed the people again. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23. Then the presence of Yahweh, of, of Jah, appeared to all the people, and fire, and fire, Isat, fire came forth. Now, fire, Ethiopically, also is a metaphor for intelligence in the sense of divine intelligence. Just, just a note. And fire came forth and consumed the quarter by note on the altar, on the Meshawiyah and Leviticus chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. And the people shouted and fell on their faces. Leviticus 9 and 24, that means that they, they prostrated all the way down on their faces, as you see um, the Ethiopian, you know, uh, uh, Christianity in Ethiopia, especially Orthodoxy, the, the Tawahido, Beta Christian, um, even Muslims and other faith-based traditions, you, you, you understand that they are different different postures, there's different gestures. And if we study hieroglyphs, you know, and some of the hieroglyphic uh, determinative, you know, determinative, um, we might learn a lot about the connection, you know what I'm saying, between these things that, um, 
I can say ancient kind of, even if you look at dances, for example, certain dances today, you know, if you look at some African videos where the white man was exploring and, and colonizing and everything, um, and you see some of the indigenous dances, and you can see some links in dances far uh, uh, disconnected by time and space. And it's interesting because these things are like in our DNA. So we can do it consciously or we can go through the school of hard knocks, you know what I'm saying, if we survive to come to that opportunity. But either way, we should do it before it's too late. And so the people shouted, they shouted, as I say, ja! and they fell on their faces, right? Now, here we have to deal with the sin of Nadab and Abihu, the sin of Nadab and Abihu. Now, it's interesting looking at some of these classic European um, paintings. This is, this is James Tissolo, the priests are destroyed. They offered the strange fire. See that right there? They offered the strange fire, right? And it's like they're by the poles of, like the poles of the ark or something like that. They offered the strange fire, and they were, um, and they were killed. Now, what, do, what, what can we learn from this... Um, this verbal hieroglyphic, this, this, this parable, this, this dark saying, in a sense. It, it, because what, what, what was the strange fire? You know, that, that's interesting. Now, what's interesting is the connection also with Christ as the Anabosa. You know, saying Christ as the cannabis or the cannabis as the Christ experience. You know, was, now, as the lamb's bread, you know, as the lamb's bread. And um, what's interesting is looking at the Schofield here, the Schofield sums it up like this. They say strange fire, fire, Isat, right? Isat, from before the Lord had kindled upon the altar of burnt offering the fire which the Kia of the priest was to keep burning in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12. No commandment had yet been given when we get to Leviticus um, chapter uh, 16, verse 12, on how the incense, get this, how the ishens, right, how the it on the incense should be kindled. Now, the sin of Nadab and Abihu was in acting in the things of Ha Elohim, the things of, of God, without seeking the mind of God. Now, that is interesting. They were acting in the things of God, but they did not seek the divine intelligence. So fire being a type of intelligence, it was strange intelligence or strange, strange knowledge or strange ideas. They were, they were not what Yahweh, they were not what was according to what he had commanded or ordained or already shown in and through Moses and his brother Aaron, the high priest Aaron. So we learn in chapter 10, because chapter 9 basically deals with um, the priests beginning their ministry. We have a New Testament type in the, what happened post-crucifixion, and particularly in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. You know, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter one, because that's now that's between the, the 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 resurrection or first fruits. In other words, the the eighth day, the Shemini or Bethsemen Tenyawum, and moving forward, right about about another another fifty days to Pentecoste or to uh, Shavuot. You know, saying to the harvest the Subai to the Harvest Festival, right? So we see a link right there in Chapter 9, right? In Chapter 9 with the New Testament, the priests beginning their ministry, Jehovah's, and um, this present time. Now, uh, Nadab and Abihu was acting in the things of God without seeking the mind of God. It was what is called will worship, will worship. The worship of will or, or will. And it sounds like do what thou wilt. You know what I'm saying? This is a popular occultic and so-called new age kind of thing, 
you know, and Freemasonic, Alistair Crowley kind of stuff going on, right? Um, but there's a link. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 is a New Testament upgrade that explains the background in Christ, taking that veil now off of our eyes so we can see what was it, what, what, what was the strange fire of Nadab and Abihu, you understand? Um, but this will worship, which often has a show of wisdom and humility. So will worship often looks like the true thing. It looks like the real thing. Uh, it's a show of wisdom, not true wisdom. It's a show of humility. It says it typifies any use of carnal means to kindle the fire of devotion and praise. That's interesting right there. Any carnal or fleshy means to kindle what? The fire of devotion and praise, like using an artificial means. Now, when we compare that with the, with the anabosum or the cannabis, we see this as when you always hear in the world marijuana or the, the cannabis getting caught up with either beer or kind of like strong drinks, liquor, and beer, or you see it getting caught up with um, like crack or cocaine or other kind of methamphetamines, big pharma kind of pharmaceuticals, Xanax and all these Benadryl, all these kind of strange names and strange gods, and ones are taking all these different things, and then they always put like with the so-called Whitney Houston um, autopsy, they always put out there, oh, marijuana, you understand, even though that's not what, you know, killed them, you understand, but since the marijuana was not in its sacramental state, and was probably not being taken for any medicinal or healing reasons, because we know Christ both is the one who is, is, is holy and shows us as human beings how to live that exemplary way of life and, and even life more abundantly. And so, so we have that, 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 that holy aspect. And then we also have that... Um, that healing aspect is the healing that you know the medane medhane alem is the medane alem the medhane alem that he is the healing of the world he is the salvation of the world if the world would receive him on his conditions you see that's what we say it's a lie when they say that um you know, the love of God is unconditional. No, there is condition. This is why it's mentioned, you know, there are conditions. You know what I mean? And instead of telling the people that, you know, this is what we could understand, who are the opposers of Christ? You know, because that's the people busy with that. They'll think as though they really were, were, were in a communion with Christ, and they were not. They were in communion with Antichrist. That's why Paul says one can't sit at the table of devils you know, and, and partake communion, and then with Christ. Now, with the cannabis connection, this is very, very interesting. You know, and when I and I, um, you know, a new, a new scroll that we've been talking about, the Cannabis Matrix, which are three essays of, of Ionis, the composer, as well as an appendix, what we call a Sheshat Appendix, so-called Ancient Egyptian Cannabis Goddess or Cannabis um, Principle, one can say, if you look at it more scientifically, you know, but mythologically, God is on that sort of level. But um, it's interesting because Christ would say that wisdom is justified by what? You understand? All of her children. You understand? So that kind of link from Christ's own mouth, and it wasn't to his physical mother. You understand? Because he wasn't in, he wasn't that stage of the God. You know what I'm saying? He was the fulfillment you understand, of the whole cycle, you understand, in our black Lord and Savior, he was a fulfillment of that. So when the woman came up to him and said, um, blessed be the, 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 the womb and, and the paps, the womb, and the, the womb that gave birth to you and the paps, the titties that gave suck to you, he said more, he said, he, he said like almost like whatever, but w what's really more blessed, 
you know, is to hear the word of God and the word and do it, to do the word of God, which is the will of God to fulfill his word of instruction of the Father. So now in looking at this strange fire, it's interesting because we know that it's the altar of, of incense, right? It's before the Lord, but it's will worship, you know what I'm saying? And this will worship is, is a, a type of any kind of use of carnal means to kindle the fire of devotional praise. That's something that ones have to think about for a moment in order to understand, well, if it was wrong then to kindle strange fire, wouldn't it also be wrong now? But what is eye and eye overstanding? You know, what is the eyes overstanding when you come across this strange fire? What does this strange fire really mean in its context, both in the Old Testament sense, but then in, in, in its fulfillment in Christ? In other words, looking at it then as, 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 as like a parable, but now in its living sense in the present time in Christ, in Christ and I and I, what does this mean? How does that equate to, in a New Testament sense, strange fire? Can we say that the church, or in particular the black church, you understand, has been using strange fire? Some say so. Some say it's the contemptible gospel or the contemporary gospel music of today. They say some say it's no more than worldly music. Some even go further and say it's all those instruments, it's instrumental music. That instrumental music is not what Yahweh willed for in the sense of his kedase. You know, if people want to play instruments and, you know, and, and, and amuse themselves in moderation, they can do so. But for his worship, in other words, in his space and to him, he's already ordained that it's I and I voices. It's the praise of I and I as the corporate, as the corporate body and, and that corporate man or that corporate church. You understand? That it's our voices, you know, and, and very little instrumentation. In fact, maybe the most instrumentation would be, you understand, the drum. You understand, the most instrumentation that we see biblically consistent all the way through, it would be like the kabro or the atomo or the other types of um, drums. One of the three kinds of drums have been used and perhaps the, you know, the chimes or the sonatas, you understand, would be used as well, you understand, from its, its ancient Hebraic and it's produced or it does say sense. But some look at the strange fire because this is this is something that we've thought on before. I want to share this because this is a part of it. And then it's the dietary regulations. And we just found some document um, on um, the whole dietary aspect. This is what's also contained in this particular um, Leviticus. Why Leviticus is an important part of our study, even in discipleship, is very important. You understand? Part of our study, part of our regular, our regular getting in the discipline of remembering the Sabbath day, to keep it set apart. You understand? Going over those basic studies, you know, taking down one's notes and, and, and seeking to answer certain basic, you know, questions about it. Like, what is this portion that's known as Shemini? What's the significant? We touched on one significant significance of Shemini, and from the Hebraic and the Ethiopic in connection with the, the Sabbath and the first day, even from Old Testament. So when we see the first day coming into prominence in the resurrection of our black Lord and Savior, well, there, of course there's a connection there. But that does not say that the Sabbath is no more. As the, the Gentile um, branches of Christianity have said, and was one of the conflicts between the, the, the Ethiopian church and the Romanist church during like the 15th and 16th century when they tried to force the Ethiopian church to bow to the Roman see. You understand? And, and there was great resistance to it. And, and, and that plan 
was was killed, was trampled, was paralyzed, and it never came to anything. But still, there is that spiritual warfare, you understand, know, which we must be on uh, and I guard about. So the strange fire is chapter is chapter ten. Now we want to uh, kind of touch on that with the the Kanabosan. That's what we just mentioned. The Kanabosan we know was used in the anointing oil. You understand? Let's bring this up right here from um, Fayyikra right here. And let's go to the second portion, Nadab and Abihu. Acting on their own, Aaron's sons, it was now the sons of Aaron. Now remember Aaron, the golden casting, right? Now Aaron got some sons, and these are his two sons, Nadab and Abihu. They each took his fire pan. They, they each took his fire pan, laid incense, on it and offered alien fire. Now here the 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 more Judaic um um rendering of this in, in translations alien. In a sense that would be I think it's Ingada Bamarinya, Ingada. You understand? Um alien fire which God had not commanded. Alien fire which God had not commanded. Now if you look at the word fire what does fire mean? You know what I'm saying? What is, what is fire? How many types of fire? But scripturally speaking, fire also, and from ancient, and the ancient wisdom coming out of even Egypt, when the son, his son, the true Horus, Cherui, or Israel, was called out. Now Christ is that, is that man type of the corporate body of I and I, the brotherhood. You understand the brotherhood of Rastafari. I and I as Rastafari. You understand with the new name. But now let's look at the strange alien fire for a moment. Leviticus 10 and 1. Now Elohim ha Elohim Hashem sent fire to consume them, and they died in Leviticus 10 and 2. So we have here and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense, or it on, thereon, and offered strange fire before Yahweh, before Jah, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from Jah, fire from Yahweh, and devoured them, and they died before Jah. They died before Yahweh. Now, that's interesting right there. That's interesting that this would this would happen. This is all a type that we need to comprehend in the fullness of the Moshiach, in the mind of Christ. Moses told Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, through those near to me, I show myself holy and gain glory before all the people. And Aaron remained silent. And this is Leviticus 10 and 3. And here King James renders it. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is it that Yahweh spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, that come near me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron, Aaron held his, his peace. Moses called Aaron's cousins, Mishael and El Zaphon, to carry away Nadab and Abihu's bodies to a place outside the camp, Leviticus 10 and 4. Moses instructed Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar not to mourn, not to mourn Nadab and Abihu by rending their garments, by ripping their clothing, or leaving their hair unshorn, leaving their hair in the sense unshorn or unkempt and not to go outside the tent of meeting, Leviticus 10, 6 to 7. And Hashem told Aaron that he and his sons must not drink wine or other intoxicants when they entered the tent of meeting so as to distinguish between the sacred and the profane. Now that is very interesting, even when Christ would say on that on that Passover, 
or that Lord's Supper night, he would say that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink of it anew. You know what I'm saying? And the word drink in, in ancient speak also can refer to smoking. In other words, smoking, whether it's a communal peace pipe or in some uh, spiritual communion or meditation or sacrament or medicine, so forth and so on, it was, it, it was linked, you understand? It was linked with drinking. So think about that when we think about the chalice, which is that cup in the new sense that Christ said, I will not until I do it anew in the Father's kingdom where the father would establish, as Haile Selassie, the father of Africa, could do Sabatach and also establish and, and reveal that and, and did that work. You know what I'm saying? And did that work. Now, it's interesting, the wine and the intoxicants, were they high or were they drunk? Or were they drinking other things? We kind of liken it to mixing the herb, mixing the, the cannabosa with other things like if it's sacramental wine in that sense, you know, then 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 so be it. But kind of mixing up with some of getting into the beers and and getting into especially the other kind of of, of non red wine, you know, of, of non wine alcoholic kind of products is very is very very tricky. And if one's gonna do that. They can do that, but then dealing with the caduce, dealing with the holy, we have to now recognize that the whole point of this, according to Leviticus 8, 11, um, um, 8 to 11, it says, And Yahweh spake to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes, which, which is the ordinances, the, the, the sirat, or the ordinances, Teach them all the ordinances um, which Yahweh, which Ezekiel hath spoken to them by the hand. Remember the hand as a symbol, the hand of Musa, the hand of 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 Moses. Now Moses directed Aaron, Eleazar, and Itamar to eat the remaining meal offering besides the altar, designating it most holy, and the priests do. Leviticus 10, 12 to 13. And Musa told them that their families should eat the breast of the elevation offering and the thigh of the gift offering in any clean place. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 14. Now, somebody asked themselves, as I and I asked I and I said, like, why the breast and the thigh, you know, and why is it sometimes a particular side? I mean, there must be something behind that, both in where, in where the, the, the spirituality, you know what I'm saying, and the true faith, I, I see it being kind of rebirthed and then fulfilled in Christ, you know what I'm saying? And then through Christ we can perfectly look all the way back to the foundations of the Hebrew and even into ancient Egypt, and going further in the past, and seeing that truly he, he was there in the beginning, you know what I'm saying, and even in spirit and in truth, we were there, you know what I'm saying, with him, remember, from the foundation of the earth. So there's, there's some interesting and deep mysteries, you know, um, within the word that um, come about when you ask yourself, why was it the breast, the shad, like shaddai? El Shaddai, right? Why was it the thigh? You understand the thigh like kept, you understand, or like the Ethiopia, you know, when they talk about the 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 in ancient times, um, um the panhandle, the great beer, you know, some of the constellations. There, there's an ancient link and even in the offering that Yahweh directed them, you understand, as he was seeking to upgrade 
you know, upgrade them, but they had so many system failures, you know, like the disobedience of the Israelites and the lack of faith that we read about. They're complaining and, and, and they're looking backward instead of forward. These things should be instructions to I and I individually and then collectively. Then Moses inquired about the, the goat of sin offering and was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar when he learned that it had already been burnt and not eaten in the sacred area, that Moses was angry, Leviticus 10, verses 16 to 18. Aaron answered Moses, See, this day they brought their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. Had I eaten sin offering today, would the Lord have appeared? Um, Aaron, Aaron um, asked, and when Moses heard this, he approved. In the in the next verse, verses nineteen and verse twenty. Now, of course, as you already know and should know, there is there is more kind of ancient matter to that. Even when we look into the mysteries, you understand, in ancient Egypt, the wisdom school. Remember, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts is a reason that that finally comes out in the New Testament as a revelation for us and a guide to understanding the proper context you know, of this time so we can see how to properly uh, translate and interpret you know, the wisdom in our present time. So the, that chapter is interesting right there, the strange, on the strange fire, Nadab and, and, and Abihu. You know, and that strange fire, you know, it appears that they were drunk. So they were going in to offer the Itan or the Aishans, you know, and they brought alien fire. And exactly what this um, alien, you know, what this alien fire, you know, what this alien fire um, 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 was is not specified as a thing or so much, but it seems to be a certain consciousness, a certain approach they brought to it that was strange from the context. Perhaps, it, remember, they came out of Egypt, and there was a lot of, it's like coming out of the West, coming out of America, and our whole American and Western experience. I mean, even in Africa for a thousand years, it would still take, a good portion of that thousand years, even in the life of one, uh, one person or family or group of individuals, to really kind of purge, you understand, purge kind of all of that out, you understand, or to the point that, that it, it might not be significant. You know, so you have to remember the Israelites came out of Egypt. So behind a lot of these things that Yahweh is approving of or disapproving of, is really speaking to the religious conflict that occurred in ancient Egypt between two different sort of, we can say, spiritualities or, 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 or theologies, just like today. You know, we have the sons of light and the, and, and the children of disobedience or the kind of Cain and the, and, and the Abel type, you know what I'm saying, or... Or, or, or we have we have Satan and we have Christ. You understand? So we we can see that in many different ways. In the 30s, it was it was Haile Selassie versus the Pope, the Dragon, fulfilling that particular prophecy right there. Now the dietary laws. Just going over this in basic. John he had instructed Moses and Aaron in the dietary laws of Kashrut. And, and, and that is Leviticus 11, what's known as what's kosher, in a sense, what is clean, you know, what is acceptable. So we see that even at this stage, the Israelites, even for being a, a, a nomadic people, still they had the structure of civilization. You see what I'm saying? That they had certain dietaries. So they knew which foods were good and which foods were bad, and even modern science to this very day, although the pig and the pork lobby out there, they got strong tentacles, you know, that Leviathan got a stranglehold of the politicians and others, so people can't really 
on some levels come out and really say that. Even Oprah, Oprah, she went through that years back when she came out against the meat companies and and, and the and the and the hamburger and stuff like that. And and they went through some some big legal mumbo jumbo. And she she kind of backed down a little bit, but she still were you know that focus was there. So. Even at this early time, because to see how long people have been living the way they've been living before even understanding organic or understanding the power in food, you understand that that more on one's life and, and type quality of life depends on the food they eat. Now remember, what's the purpose of the Israelites um, coming out of Egypt and us coming out of this spiritual Egypt? is to go into the land to inherit the land. So this is preparation on repatriation. You understand? So it's an exodus, but it's also deep preparation because what Yahweh is showing them in gradual downloads and upgrades, you understand, is showing them the stages, bringing them from where they were at in a certain experience that in, in spirit and in truth we're going through again as black people. You understand, as this lost remnant, the Ethiopian Hebrews, once lost but now found. So um, he says this in verse 45, and this is also found in the New Testament, and is prominently highlighted. Ye shall be holy, kiddus, which means to be set apart. To be set apart, ye shall be kiddus, for I am kiddus. Ye shall be kiddus, holy, set apart, because I am am holy. Now remember, all this is before the Nazarite, the vow of the Nazarite came into more prominence. So what we actually see is that we see kind of a living, um, you know, you have to look at it more as like evolution in a sense, you know, from being in a kind of spiritual slavery and like almost like a Stockholm syndrome and bringing a people out by stages. And then having to deal with certain eventualities that might show that, well, here was the intention of Yahweh from the very beginning, a nation of the priesthood. But when the people went backward to worship the golden calf, some can interpret that as materialism, you understand, on that sort of level. You understand, some might interpret that as going back to the, the so-called mother God, you understand, and the child instead of going to the, the man, Christ. You know, like when people look at it and say, I'm a Christian, some people like the fact that Jesus was born in a manger. That's the important part of their Christianity. And they don't really like to deal with the cross, you understand, or with, with the trials and tribulation that everyone who is holy, who seeks to live godly or seek to live holy, must go through these. You know what I'm saying? Must go through these trials and these tribulations. But we consider that to be part of the practice that brings about the perfection. You know what I'm saying? That brings about the perfection. So um, in chapters 8 and 9, there's an inter, there's an inter, or uh, inner biblical interpretation right here that goes into another aspect, um, another aspect of this. And um, we'll probably address this in the word of feet in the portion in the, in the portion to come. But brothers and sisters, it's very interesting, even the whole connection of where we're at and what we can you know what we can learn. You know, what do we learn from this? You know, it's good to take some notes. You know, especially as disciples, you know, one must get into you know writing. You know, into the writing. You know, because um, as disciples, we are like scribes. It's very interesting. We are like scribes. We go through those those degrees, those stages. And if if we can tell you, but more or less, if you would experience the kind of a, for lack of a better word, how the spirit is able to guide you in even writing certain things. What I mean by that is 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 as you take notes. You know, there's a power in writing. You know, the real deep power in writing. It's like to say if you want to hide something in, you know what I mean, in a book, as it were. But anyway, brothers and sisters, um, I'm going to pause for the cause on this. So this particular portion that is known as Shemeni, 
it has a Christological, you understand, know especially as Christ in his kingly character, Rastafari revelation to it, and, it, and even a particular significance to us in this 2012 period of time. But how each one will get it for themselves is to understand the foundation, the context, the scriptural context. And once again, we want to say to ones and ones, a Meltam Fasika and the eat uh, and jera the al of the unleavened bread and, as well as the um the the, the bekurat, you understand the the first fruits which is symbolic of resurrection you understand or as rastafari says um uprising in and the movement of ja people so shalom rastafari and until we meet again may ja guide you and and protect you as we walk through this valley of the shadow of death. Shalom.